Broadcasting from Sydney, Australia, this is Front and Centre with Emilio Garcia. Brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Snowflakes are taking over, and conservatives are furious about it. When Kellyanne Conway referred to young liberal college students as far too delicate or snowflakes, the term was widely adopted. Many conservatives said that they are sick and tired of the fake news media and the snowflake they see on the fake news media, and so they get all their news from Fox News and Breitbart to avoid being triggered by the triggered leftists that are always so triggered. When an MTV video emerged suggesting New Year's resolutions for white people, conservatives everywhere were outraged, angered, and made MTV take the video down, because the snowflakes in that video were saying things they disliked, and that they were making them feel very upset. When it comes to being triggered, we're fighting fire with Kennedy. This is Front and Center. Hello and welcome to Front and Center. I'm Emilio Garcia. Really quickly acknowledge two things. Yes, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, the reason that I wasn't wearing them in the previous two episodes is because on my way to record my very first episode, I actually lost them uh, while walking to the studio. And uh, another thing that you might have noticed is that the microphone isn't very pretty uh, for those of you actually watching the video. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, we'll definitely have a nicer mic next time. Let's talk really quickly about what I was saying uh, earlier about people getting triggered. Now, the fact of the matter is, yes, it's fun to make fun of all of these liberal college students, all these liberals and all these leftists getting so easily triggered by any little thing, any little troll, but we have to make sure that we're not falling into the same trap, because the fact of the matter is that being offended is way, way, way too common. Uh, often we'll see that you can get offended by something. You can see something online, you can read something. But the issue is that we get offended and we take things way too far. A very famous example of this was Justine Sacco. She um, she made a joke right before she got her on a plane to South Africa. Uh, she tweeted out, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. And basically while she was on the plane, took, you know, from LA to uh, New York to South Africa, you know, very, very long flight, she fell asleep, turned off her phone, and while she was on the plane, People basically took over this uh, this tweet, started tweeting it. It became the number one trending topic, uh, a trending topic on Twitter. And by the time that she had landed in Johannesburg or in Cape Town, she had lost her job, and she had, she was being bullied. She was being uh, you know uh, threatened with violence, all these really shady things. She was actually even photographed at uh, Cape Town. And uh, the thing is that for for me, I mean, when I look at the at the tweet and look back at her other tweets, which now she deleted her Twitter, of course. But when she had other tweets, she was basically one of those people with dark humor. She was kind of trying to be funny with her friends, uh, much the same way that the people at South Park or Family Guy are. But she made a joke which sounded to me more like a blonde, dumb blonde joke than a racist joke. But essentially people took over it and demanded that, you know, basically she lose her life over it. And uh, she lose everything that she has, including her job and her friends over it, which I think is just taking it a step too far. And the same thing has happened with Jimmy Fallon, for example. In early January of last year, then-Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump appeared on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon for a goofy interview with softball questions. Viewers expecting a more hard-hitting cable news-esque round of questioning were enraged. In a new interview with The New York Times, Fallon opens up about the Trump interview and the intense reaction to it, which devastated him. Also, Stephen Colbert. So people are calling for Stephen Colbert to be fired and to have a boycott of his show after he made a homophobic joke about Trump and Putin. Now, uh, during his monologue, Colbert launched into a series of Trump insults that he himself uh, admitted to lacking dignity. And he says, the only thing your mouth is good for is being Vladimir Putin's cock holster. Oh. And recently, Bill Maher. Let's talk about a conversation a lot of folks have been having this weekend. We're talking about Bill Maher. Made a career out of being controversial, but this time a lot of people think he has gone too far using one of the most controversial words in the English language. For now, I'll say the N-word, but just so you're not shocked, like Maher's guests and the audience were, I want to warn you that you're about to hear that word itself in this discussion with my guests. No beeping. I've got to get to Nebraska more. <laughs> I... You're welcome. We'd love to have you work in the fields with us. Work in the field. That's part of that. That's <laughs> Senate. I'm a house nigga. What do you think, Bakari? Well, I don't think it's a joke. I think it's vile. I think it's despicable. You can voice your opinion when it comes to someone saying something that you find inappropriate. You can tell them that you don't like it. But, for example, Chance the Rapper, when Bill Maher said the N-word, 
said, please, HBO, never air another episode of Real Time with Bill Maher again. That seems out there. You're ruining someone's career because they decided to make a bad joke. You know, yeah, which was definitely in bad taste. You know, the N-word is something that you really shouldn't ever say in a public th forum or really anywhere. But I just don't think that, uh, that the SJW approach to a slip-up is good because it's you do something that offends me, you do think that something that I think is inappropriate, and you should suffer and lose everything. So we have to be careful if we're going to be the level-headed people here to avoid falling into this trap. Let's move on now to Left and Left Behind. So Left and Left Behind is a segment where I talk about things uh, in the liberal circles that I think are good and bad. The ones that I think are good, I call left. The ones that I think are bad, I call left behind. So let's start with good old left. So Bob Garfield, he is a an amazing journalist. He's on the On the Media podcast with uh, Brooke Gladstone. He's amazing. He gives amazing interviews. That's probably one of his strongest suits. And he's a really good journalist. And he, he interviews the president of the SPLC. For uh, my Australian listeners who may not know who that is, it's the Southern Poverty Law Center. And the Southern Poverty Law Center is a nonprofit that goes after hate groups, mostly suing on behalf of victims or groups. And they've actually done a lot of good. The, the group is great. Uh, they... Uh, a lot of the, the lawsuits that they're involved in actually have some really historic uh, results, and a lot of the information that we have about hate groups is because of this group. But there is a lot of uh, a lot of criticism revolving with them, uh, including their two hundred million dollars offshore and the, how they certain uh, how how they've categorized certain uh, groups incorrectly to the point of view of some people. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present to you a very edited down version of this interview, but I think that, that you get kind of the, the uh, whole message and what Bob Garfield was trying to do. So let's listen. Richard Cohen is the president of the Southern Poverty Law Center, who dismisses the criticism as partisan smoke with no underlying fire. Why do you have so much cash parked offshore? Look... We have an excellent investment advisor called Cambridge Associates. They have us invested in certain funds that typically are incorporated offshore. And it's an extraordinarily common thing for endowments like ours. I'm not sure it is common for 501c3 advocacy organizations. It might be common for university endowments. But you're raising money all the time, ostensibly for the purposes of carrying out your mission. There doesn't seem to be an easy explanation for why you have such a large endowment set aside and you're still seeking funds for ongoing operations. Sure, that's a separate question. We've started an endowment very early in our history, really to give us the strength to continue our work far into the future. All right, but once again, then, there is the apparent conflict between your fundraising appeals, which proclaim a sense of urgency to fight the good fight, and the fact that you have five or six years of operating revenue stashed in the Caribbean or elsewhere. Stashed in the Caribbean makes it sound like a really nefarious thing. And if you call a place like Cambridge that advises literally thousands of endowments, they'll tell you the same thing I do. With well, let's more just authority. say invested prudently outside of the state of Alabama. Okay. How do you reconcile the enormous endowment with the urgent messages for cash from donors to fight intolerance and hatred from extreme players? So let me tell you what I think is great about this episode. Um, Bob Garfield is openly liberal. The SPLC is a group that's often cited by the left to make their points. It's very, 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 like the people on the left see it as a very, very, very good organization. It just shows a lot of integrity to see Bob Garfield, who always has integrity, because fucking awesome, just go after them. Ask the hard question. And he wasn't going for blood either. This is another thing that I don't like journalists doing. You essentially kind of kind of have the opportunity to do a gotcha interview, and you don't. You ask hard questions. You ask pointed questions. But you don't have to uh, always, you know, go for, for blood and try to make this person squee uh, squirm and, you know, kind of lose everything. Uh, so this was a really, really great, um, great interview. So the SPLC has a lot of problems too. And uh, here's another... Uh, liberal who who is uh, who's kind of going after the SPLC. Are you suing the Southern Poverty Law Center for calling you 
<laughs> it's funny. You're fighting extremists, but they're calling you the extremist. They were created to defend people like me. Right. They, you know? <laughs> defend people like, like me, you. right? Against right. people like the KKK, against the people that were chasing me when right. I was 15 years old with machetes and hammers and stabbing me and my friends. Uh, and, and they've decided to list me, along with Ayan Hirsi Ali, a Somali uh, uh, refugee, ex Muslim, a liberal thinker, as anti Muslim extremists. And I think, you know, I'm sick and tired of uh, a lot of the well meaning, because, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, well-meaning, liberal and left-wing, usually white men, who decide that, uh, that I am uh, saying the, uh, what they don't agree with, don't allow for me to say about my own community, my own religious heritage, and as a result have listed me as, a, as an anti-Muslim extremist. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them to court for defamation. Uh, I, don't, I don't think these lists are And helpful. you're crowdfunding it. I will be, yeah, I will be crowdfunding I'd like to be part of that crowd. So, Mahid Nuwaz, who is very vocal about radical Islam, uh, started a nonprofit, the first nonprofit that goes against radicalization. And he speaks out against Islamophobia very frequently, but he also speaks a lot about, uh, about, you know, very candidly about how it is that a lot of Muslim countries have such radical ideologies, how uh, a lot of people are getting radicalized, etc., etc. And the SPLC labeled him a hate group, as you saw in the video. And so he's suing them. And it's, it looks like he's going to win, as you see in the end of the video. Bill Maher is actually uh, apparently funding a, a pretty substantial part of it. But he's actually not the only one that's had an issue with the SPLC. Last question. Uh, we have the issue of this, the Supreme Court dealing with two issues involving gay marriage. I've asked you a lot of questions. I've never asked you that. You're, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. It's a well-established, uh, fundamental pillar of society. And uh, no group, uh, be they gays, be they NAMLA, uh, be they people who believe in bestiality, it, it doesn't matter what they are, they don't get to change the definition. So, that was Ben Carson, of course, the most boring freaking political figure of all time. Unbelievable just how he can say something so outrageous and still be boring. Um, so he was listed uh, as anti-gay by the SPLC. He was listed as an anti-gay radical. And he had, and they essentially retracted the comment, and here's why. Be they gays, be they NAMLA, uh, be they people who believe in bestiality, it, it doesn't matter what they are, they don't get to change the definition. So mm. it's not something that's against gays, it's, it's against anybody who wants to come along yeah. and change the fundamental definitions of pillars of society. So if you didn't catch up to that, essentially, he, he was very imprudent and he was very unintelligent to kind of bunch together uh, homosexuals with people that like to fuck animals and people who like to fuck children. I mean, that was, that was really, really a bad choice of uh, grouping on his part. And I can see why people were upset because it was so stupid of him to do. But essentially what he's saying there is not that he hates gay, and essentially he actually goes back and says that it's not anything to do with gay people. Uh, his issue is that you can't come in and change the definition of marriage, which uh, I don't agree with him at all. And I think that, you know, he, he's just a, an enormous piece of shit. But he, but he certainly isn't an anti-gay extremist. And, uh, and so he is very, very boring, but he's not hateful. And so this is another issue that the SPLC has had. And I really respect the, the fact that there are uh, liberals going after this group, despite the fact that they have so much respect for the SPLC, and despite the fact that the SPLC is fighting against so many of the groups that uh, a lot of people on the left are fighting for. So let's move on now to left and left behind. And uh, I'm sorry, to left behind, purely. So on this episode, I'm talking about something that I see on the left a lot, which I really can't fucking stand, and it's over-inclusiveness. And... Essentially, what this means is that anytime that you're talking about a subject, anytime that you're saying something, you have to include every category of person by name, otherwise you're excluding them. And then you're bad, essentially. You're racist, sexist, ableist, whatever. Hey, kittens. I don't know. Essentially, anytime that you, that you don't, that you don't uh, specifically mention a marginalized group, you're, you're, you're excluding them and that makes you a bad person. And that's, that's pretty much summed up in this video here. 
The rainbow flag is the single most recognizable icon for the LGBTQ community. It's a symbol for everyone to rally around, yet communities across the country are divided. People of color have been marginalized, ignored, and even intentionally excluded. We say that we're inclusive. We celebrate it. Now it's time to go further, to broaden the horizons of our community, to change our iconic symbol. It's just a start, but it's a start. To not just talk about being inclusive, but to finally do it. Join us at morecolormorepride.com. So I think when speaking to this audience here, I don't have to explain why this is kind of silly. But if a lot of you don't really get why I think that this is silly, uh, as far as I'm concerned, black and brown is not a sexual orientation. And I don't understand how LGBTQ+, plus, which is supposed to be about gender identity and sexual orientation, is now lumping in... Um, brown and black people. So I, I, I was I was a little bit uh, concerned about this and I wanted to look for some perspectives. So I found this guy. It's an incredibly strong way to send a really, really bold message out there to say that we absolutely will not tolerate racism within the LGBT plus community or the wider world any longer. Our rainbow flag has already gone through several drastic changes. The original flag had pink and turquoise in it before those colors were later removed. So who's to say that we can't make further changes to the flag now if it makes more people feel more included? And he makes some good points. I, I suppose that if it makes people feel more included, why not? Uh, as as uh, he says, basically there's a lot a lot of racism in, in the gay community, it turns out, and uh, people are basically very openly racist uh, in a lot of uh, pride rallies and uh, on their apps and things like that. So I can kind of understand his point, and he doesn't make a bad point at all. However, so if you haven't heard about the recent fucking dumbass shit that's been happening, in Philadelphia, they have decided to put black and brown on the LGBT flag. I can't believe that it took so long for, for them to represent black people when for so many years it's been representing people that are purple and red and blue. I can't believe this. What is the point of putting race into the LGBT pride flag when the pride flag isn't even about race. Yes. <laughs> I mean, this very annoyed uh, blogger lisps perfectly what I was thinking. The gay pride flag is not about race. It's about sexual orientation and gender identity. So why are we lumping in things that have nothing to do with the subject matter? I don't know. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very leftist thing to do. But when we are so tedious about inclusiveness and we are basically just nitpicking and trying to find you know subtext where there's no subtext to be read things like this happen chris pratt apologized in sign language to fans after posting a video that asked users to turn the sound up rather than rely on subtitles having been criticized for not being understanding of those who are deaf and hard of hearing and who therefore depend on subtitles pratt took to instagram to say sorry from the bottom of his heart Yes, that really happened. He had to apologize in sign language because he told people to listen to the videos on Facebook and not just read the subtitles. And he was accused of ableism because he wasn't being considerate to people who are hearing impaired. What a fucking asshole. I mean, honestly... Jesus Christ. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is that sometimes in common speech, you are going to exclude people. I mean, you, you, you can't be thinking constantly about every marginalized group there is ever and make sure that your speech is not excluding them, especially for such a, a, a simple, silly subject like this. Asking people to please listen to the, to, the, to the audio of a commercial as opposed to reading the subtitles. So essentially, a, a, an artist can say... Hey, please, you know, listen to my record. And he's also an ableist because there are people that can't listen to him. So, I mean, really, I mean, if you think that this is the most stupidly obnoxious thing anyone can apologize for, 
Gap is apologizing for a new ad that they put out, which features uh, children in various poses. So the problem was that there's a, a, a white kid using a black kid as an armrest. Now, of course, it got a lot of criticism on Twitter, and as a result, Gap has apologized. Now, let me give you some more context into this story because it definitely matters. Two years prior to this ad coming out, Gap featured a similar ad. Okay, let's take a look at that. And it features uh, a black kid putting, uh, you know, their ha hand on or arm on a white kid, right? I'm just so tired of these stories. I don't know what to say. This is what happens when we allow idiots to impose their standards on society. We end up apologizing for bullshit. Now, everyone who votes for Trump, people that wouldn't be very, very far to the right, will do that now, right? Because, ew, liberals, look how stupid they are. Honestly, there was, I mean, you see in the, in the video that there was a commercial a few years earlier with a black girl holding her arm over a white girl, and that was no problem. But when a, when a white girl does it to a black girl who turns out to be her sister, that's somehow racist because you're not being sensitive to how some black people feel about uh, oppression. I don't know, like literally oppression. It's just very, very silly. So uh, this is not something that I want to see, and it is something that I definitely dislike uh, in liberal circles. So now let's move on to right and not right. So getting started with some right. I want to speak about conservatives' defense for real equality. So this jewel here, a true jewel, is a great example of this. Uh, you also said that men deserve a safe space on campus, but I would have to say that every space in society is actually a safe space for men. Men don't get catcalled when they walk down the street. Women deserve a space, safe space on campus. Queer people deserve a safe, safe space on campus. Trans people deserve a space, safe space on campus. Why do men need a safe space on campus? Why do men need a yeah, safe space? Because the very idea of an event, of an event where men are talking about men's issues in, <coughs> in a non-sanctioned manner, but if I were one of the men who was trying to attend an event talking about male suicide and all kinds of other stuff, and I had some woman who knows she can get away with it up in my face calling me every name in the book, screaming at me, I don't think I'd feel very safe, right? Okay, and, and frankly, men are the majority of victims of public sphere violence. I'm not saying that any of those statistics or male suicide, any of that stuff exists, because it does. Men are the victims of more workplace violence, workplace uh, su like suicides, low uh, enrollment rates. That's that. That's not systematic oppression in society. Really? I think really? that I think that when really? when a six-year-old girl, when a six-year-old girl can hit a, another child and get away with it, and never ever have to suffer retaliation because he's a boy. Okay. I think that's systematic. How? 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 <laughs> because if the system intervenes and punishes the boy for hitting back, right? It's systematic. That's what I'm talking about. See, that is what conservatism is really about. It's an unapologetic, direct defense using logic and facts. See, this, this should be the face of conservatism. When it comes to two people saying that conservatives are, are less uh, inclusive than liberals, or less tolerant than liberals, show them this. This is the exact definition. This is really what conservatism is about. Real equality, not virtue signaling equality. This is also a great example of this. We talk about separate but equal, but you know, having even mentioned the Floyd Mayweather fight, they walked away with you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake, you being at the, at the height of your sport, maybe make what, a, a million dollars at most per fight? Does that anger you and what can we do to change that? Uh, I don't like to talk about exactly how much money I make, but I'm extremely comfortable and happy. You are? Yes. Okay, so. And, uh, you know, if I got to a point where I had almost 50 fights, I would probably be making close to the same amount of money that Floyd does. But at this point, I have 11. So <laughs> I can't expect it to be exactly um, equal yet, I don't think. I have to put more time in. Okay, so you see this? This is actual feminism. Because the feminism that we see today, I wouldn't even call it feminism. It's sexist schizophrenia. Honest to God. And in the words of Bill Maher, somebody tweet at me right now and tell me how that was ableist or inappropriate so I can tell you to go fuck yourself. I mean, 
the, the fact of the matter is that she had she had a chance to play the victim and she didn't. And uh, speaking of non self deprecating feminists, you're not worried that they'll just check out the sexual references and, and not care about the music. Is that, is that something that worries you? No. Not at all. I've got three number one records, and I've sold almost four million albums worldwide. So, so what's the biggest thrill of your career so far? The gay community. Oh, wow. Why? Can you... Because I love them so much. Because they don't ask me questions like that. Because <laughs> they love sexual, strong women who speak their mind. You see, if I was a guy, and I was sitting here with a cigarette in my hand, grabbing my crotch and talking about how I make music because I love fast cars and fucking girls. You'd call me a rock star. But when I do it in my music and in my videos, because I'm a female, because I make pop music, you are judgmental. And you say that it is uh, um, distracting. I'm just a rock star. Are, are you also a feminist? I'm not a feminist. I, I hail men. I love men. I, I celebrate American male culture and beer and bars and, and, and muscle cars. Um, but that's not what you asked me. You asked me if my music was distracted by my sexuality, and it's not. The, uh, it's so true. And we see this everywhere. And, uh, you know, you would think that with feminism, which is all about you know, just being equal to men and being able to just be your own entity and being powerful and everything like that, that feminists kind of try to lump any uh, female expression of sexuality as objectification. And what she says here is essentially the, the same thing. I mean, the, the th what I'm saying is that if this was a guy and he was playing rock and roll and he was talking about how many girls he fucks every night and, you know, driving fast cars and all these things, well, then there wouldn't be a, a problem. But, you know, since she's a, a woman, since Lady Gaga's a woman, then, you know, she's just an objectified pop symbol who, uh, who is just, you know, objectifying herself and sending a poor message to girls. I mean, if that's sending a poor message to girls, then what's happening with, uh, with the, the rock stars who are sending extremely bad messages to boys? So, yeah, men do it. They're just badasses. Women do it. They're objectified. I don't agree with that. And good, good on Lady Gaga for saying that. I think I've praised Lady Gaga two weeks in a row now. Anyway... Speaking of a badass woman, here is Miss Camille Paglia. So in the realm of free speech, I just was curious about your thoughts on the backlash received by uh, Professor Jordan Peterson on the University of Toronto campus, if you heard of the issue. No, I haven't. Can you want, you want to tell, tell, tell us a little bit? Um, basically, he is a, in opposition of uh, Bill C-16, um, and he, his basic, basically his refusal of using gender pronouns uh, on the campus is... Received oh. an enormous backlash, and there's videos on YouTube to wait, sort of document. Wait, th he, this professor refused to use the, the pronouns that yes. are being de requested or demanded by transgender yes. activists. Yes. Okay. Well, more power to him. Okay, is what I say. Okay, this is getting ridiculous. Okay, as I, as I, my PhD is in English literature. Okay, from Yale. Right, and I do not. And, and it's fine. Contribute to the language. Okay, write a poem. Okay, write a book. Okay, certainly. Okay, look at the way Gloria Steinem. The one, her one great accomplishment is that she was a co-founder of Ms. Magazine. Okay, all right, and and there was the contribute a very important contribution made by the word by Ms. Okay, because before this, unlike the Romance languages, you know, in, in English, um, you had you had Mrs. or Miss. Okay, so um, so, so if you were unmarried at, at, at age 40, 50, 60, you were still called Miss in, in this very demeaning way. Ms. was a very important contribution to the language. It took time to be absorbed. Okay, but this political agitation to change everyday common speech are you kidding me okay all right people shouldn't be putting up with this for one second what kind of nonsense is this absolute nonsense okay and these people who are searching for their own identity okay and want to impose on others that is not my philosophy of the libertarian that is an invasion an intrusion into other people's personal rights who I we, excuse us you know the English language is owned okay by everyone how dare you you sniveling little you know Maniac, you tell us how we're going to use pronouns. Go take a hike, I say to them. Okay, that's what I say. Okay, all right. So here's my interpretation of this. She doesn't care what your pronoun is. I think that she, especially when she's saying that you can contribute to the language, I think that she's saying that that's acceptable. You know, you can ask to be uh, uh, called whatever you, you feel like. 
But what she doesn't agree with, and I agree with her on this, is that you cannot just decide, as a very small group of the population, that you're going to impose your standards on the rest of society, and then ostracizing them when they don't conform. So th this is shown, for example, uh, there, there are several videos where basically uh, people are shouted down because they call a trans person who would rather be called they or Z, uh, he or she. And he and they lose their mind and they yell at them and they call them ignorant as fuck, things like this. And right now there's a, there's a, a bill in California basically saying that if you're a medical professional and you refer to a person as he or she that doesn't want to be called he or she, that that could actually uh, involve jail time. So so uh, I, I guess that that's taking it too far. And I agree that you're not allowed to uh, to impose your will on other people. But that being said, this that I'm going to show you right now is going a bit too far. Why are we mainstreaming delusion? Uh, it's not delusion. Why, why would delusion. you call it delusion? Because Bruce Caitlyn Jenner, I'll call him Caitlyn Jenner. No, it's that's her. The, You're not being polite to the pronoun. Because it's disrespect. It, okay, forget about the disrespect. Facts don't care about your feelings. It turns out that every chromosome, every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body is male with the exception of some of his sperm cells. So you don't know what you're talking about. You're not educated on genetics. Would you to discuss the genetics? Or well, well, no, what no. What are your genetics? Sir? I, I, so I'd stay away from the genetics and back to the brain scans. You cut that out now or you'll go home in an ambulance. Yeah, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political discussion. Okay, so this is just you being a dick. So, so uh, the lady was out of line by, by threatening Ben Shapiro, uh, you know, said, telling him that he was going to go home in an ambulance. But uh, first of all, Ben Shapiro really was trying to get an argument, uh, a reaction out of her. And like he says, you know, I can't force you to decide what to think about trans people. I absolutely can't. But there is such a thing as just being a decent human being and just being polite. And, you know, for someone who talks so much about traditional values and, and being a good person, as Ben Shapiro does, uh, that he would just try to be uh, an asshole to this woman and just kind of try to humiliate her and, and try to just be an enormous dick, I, I thought just was um, was really, really out of place. I mean, because really, what he's saying, yeah, yeah, like you can't obligate me to do anything. Like, if, if I think that that uh, this woman uh, is is awful. Uh, I mean, no one can stop me from calling her the c-word. I could go around and just tell every single person, every single female that I meet, that she's a bitch. Uh, and I I can say that's the church, that's the word I choose to use. That's what I think women are. That doesn't. I mean, yeah, I guess that's technically true. I can, but it's not polite or civil. It's just me being an asshole. So I really don't like it when people lump in their freedom of speech with being jerks. I mean, you're just a jerk. Don't don't try to equate it to be anything else. So let's move on now to not right. So this is something that I see a lot of people on the right do. A lot of educated, intelligent, articulate conservatives finding the easiest person to wreck and then wrecking them. So this is supposed to show how smart they are or something. I mean, take this for example. Down the flag the night before Veterans Day and set it on fire. Henceforth, says the school's president, no American flags will be flown on campus. Joining us now is Hampshire College student Daniel Vogel, who was in favor of removing the flag, though didn't burn it. Daniel, thanks all for coming on uh, tonight. So I want to read well, you yeah. a quote from you. This is to the Amherst Bulletin, and you said, Think about the groups who use the flag, from police officers to the U.S. Army. These are the forces on the ground that make oppression happen. Now, the obvious point is, obviously, if the police and the Army were to go away, sensitive college students like you would be eaten alive. Let me ask you a deeper question, which is, you find America unfair? Okay. What's a fairer country? Can you think of a country where you'd rather, for example, go on trial for a felony? Um, okay. I think to respond to your question, there isn't really a country I'd rather be tried for a felony in. Um, per, I, and I, I, don't, I really doubt that it's, um, it's, it's not really about me, you know? Um, it's about uh, black people and people of color in this country who, if they were tried for a felony, are much more likely than me to be put in prison for that. Okay, and then, I'm sure then I'll, there are I'll, shift the, I'll shift the question there. And, and by the way, I'm not arguing, never would argue that there aren't inequities here, that it's a perfect country or anything like that. Of course not. But is there a of country in, w in which African Americans would stand a chance of a fairer trial than the United States? Is there you a fairer country? I mean, uh, I guess my, my question is, like, do you have perspective on the world? When you say that all police and all cops are bad, do you really know what you're talking about? That's like a useful question to ask, like, which country would I rather be in? I'd rather that we focus on this country and how we can, you know, fix and improve this country. Um, but why removing is the flag it, I mean, isn't this... Okay, I, I get it, but it, I, and I think we should fix and improve the country. 
But you're basically saying the flag represents evil to the extent that it shouldn't be flown. And my question is, why is it always rich kids who make that point? What, what's the median family income in this country? Do you know? It's the wealth of the people who've been, who've, who've been oppressed and who've had things stolen from them that allow me to go to this institution. But and then, the so why are you doing it? it I mean, honest, no, but honestly, why are you doing it? I mean, why not go pick, pick apples in Washington State? Why are you consuming $62,000 a year of this blood money, as you describe it, to sit around campus and do pointless rhetorical and symbolic acts like burning flags. You're for diversity, obviously, and yet I bet there's virtually nobody on your campus who's openly supporting Donald Trump. Do you yearn for more diversity on your campus, or are you happy in a world where everyone thinks like you? Okay, so Tucker Carlson is a guy, first of all, that needs to change his youthful haircut and notice that he's like 70 years old, uh, but he's really, really, really intelligent, and he's very educated, and he's really articulate. So I don't understand what exactly he's trying to prove by attacking some dumbass first year uh, about uh, his views on socialism. I don't know what that's supposed to prove. Obviously, Tucker Carlson is going to beat him up without you know even thinking about it, with you know two hands behind his back, linguistically at least. Uh, so I don't really know what he's trying to achieve. Uh, and what about? Are you guys millennials? Are you asking us if we accept that label or if we fit into? the conceived notion of the label. Let's not overthink this. Okay. Do you like Donald Trump? I think Donald Trump is an egomaniac. He races. He only likes his con. If Trump only likes his con, why did he marry an immigrant? Oh, you see me? I ain't know that. That's just something new. I just found out about you. What about the wall? Really? The wall? He wants to make Mexico pay for it. The cost of that wall is like 1% of their entire GDP. This country has become a joke and Donald Trump is the punchline. Bernie should be president. How many jobs has Bernie Sanders created? A lot of jobs. More than Donald Trump? From what I, what I see, yeah. How did Bernie create jobs? All the old buildings he making into like new businesses, like an office business, construction business, whatever. I think you're talking about Trump. That's Trump? Yes. I apologize. Trump is the real estate developer. Real estate? Like housing? Yes. Bernie is the senator. Why would you say that for? That's the truth. No, I don't think so. Do you have a problem with capitalism? There's always room for improvement. How do you improve on capitalism? Just not, just not do capitalism anymore. Find a new way. You know what I mean? So, let me let me say this. I mean, first of all, this guy is just a, an enormous asshole. But uh, my God, biggest douchebag in the world. But you know, he's walking around and he's uh, he's talking to all these millennials in NYC, and I don't buy that they're that they didn't find any millennials in Central Park that had more intelligent things to say than these idiots. I mean, you have amazing universities in NYC. You have very, very good families, very, very educated people who are creating, uh, you know, who are basically, uh, who have children who grow up educated and articulate and informed. And I'm supposed to believe that in that big city going up to any millennial that you see, you're only going to find these idiots. Of course not. This is highly edited. And, um, I mean, again, I don't really see what the, what what point he's trying to prove is. You know, uh, millennials are idiots, so Trump is great. I don't think so. And uh, really, I mean, uh, this is this is just one of those things that uh, he, I don't think that he could actually stand up to somebody uh, linguistically who is uh, you know of normal intelligence and actually has uh, three or four minutes in the day to actually read the newspaper. So I, I don't think that uh, that interviewing idiots proves your point. But what about interviewing rappers? Personal story segment tonight on June 7th, Chicago rapper Lupe Fiasco, who is promoting an album called President Obama, a terrorist. What do you mean President Obama is a terrorist? My fight against terrorism, to me, the biggest terrorist is Obama in the United States of America. To put it into context, um, I was asked about a song that I did called Words I Never Said, which uh, addresses terrorism. So the statement that I made, which was, I believe that the biggest terrorist, uh, Obama, and the United States of America, and its foreign policy, that was what the whole, you know, context of everything was. President Obama is not a terrorist. He's trying to do what he believes is the right thing to do. Uh, the, the United States is not a bad nation. It's a noble nation. We're trying to defend ourselves against people who killed us on 9-11. Cool. And, and then you go out there and you talk to a lot of younger people. And this is what gets me. That your constituency okay. are not exactly political science PhDs, okay? They're impressionable well, I kids. Don't think, I don't think that that matters. I don't think you need no, to have a political PhD to understand politics. They listen well, to, to you. Understand 
politics, to understand politics, I don't think you necessarily need that. And I don't think that politics are as complex as people like to make them seem or out to be. Richard Nixon said that, you know, if you, they reduced fear by reducing the causes of fear. But if you're gonna fight terrorism, to me, you fight the root causes of terrorism. The root causes of terrorism are many. Okay, they are varied. It depends region to region and all of that. The United States cannot cure ills in the world. What the President of the United States' responsibility is, is to protect you and me. You know what I had a problem with? The war, the war in Afghanistan. Okay, you're, right? you have the a problem with Afghanistan. the war in Let Afghanistan. Let me finish. The point, the point of the war of, Af of Afghanistan was yeah. supposedly to yeah. go in and find bin Laden. Right. Well, but no. in the interim, no, that's of the, not in right. the, no, no, in the in, in the well, 9/11. Mr. Jaco, right? Let, Osama bin Laden. What you just Osama said bin is, Laden. What you just said is fallacious. That means it's wrong. It's not the, fallacious the, at all. Yes, sir. It and it's not Here, wrong. It's not why. wrong. The point and the purpose. So why then? Why do we go to? Why are we in Afghanistan if it wasn't to hunt down Al Qaeda and the terrorist you network, sir? Because it definitely it? wasn't for any other reason. I will, no, that's wrong. I will answer it. The reason we went to Afghanistan was to deprive Al Qaeda. Of a sanctuary, the war. No, is it gives a legit. No, the the legitimate part of it is to go find a criminal, right? No, the legitimate right? Not part to, not, is not to, to aggressively remove a and government. Not to, no, the re, the legitimate part is to remove a government, which we did, which enabled a terrorist group to declare war on the United States. So, first of all, Lupe is a badass. Okay, Kick Push and Superstar are awesome songs and the guy makes really really good songs there's one song that he does sort of about capitalism that is hard for me to recommend because it's just a lot of like lol it's like uh what teens text each other they're supposed to mean things so lol wtf a lot of things uh look it up it's really good but anyway he 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 said something in a song that was really stupid uh which is that obama was a terrorist and he has a lot to say but obviously nowhere near uh the level of bill o'reilly i mean bill o'reilly is clearly a guy who's really, really intelligent, really articulate, and he's good at kind of wrapping people up in their own argument. So obviously he cleaned the floor with this with this guy. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, the videos that I found of uh, Lupe Fiasco on Bill O'Reilly were like titled Lupe Fiasco Kicks Bill O'Reilly's Ass or Humiliates Bill O'Reilly. Uh, I don't know who, who could, could see that video and not notice that Bill O'Reilly destroyed Lupe Fiasco. But... Obviously, Lupe Fiasco has, has no idea what he's talking about, and I'm not sure if that's supposed to mean that, uh, that his point, uh, the point that he was trying to make is, uh, it's correct. Not that I think that his point is correct, but, you know, basically Bill O'Reilly proving him wrong, I don't think is, uh, is very indicative of anything. So, how about this here? Um, well, so the movement, the Million Student March, um, is a movement for a more um, equitable and fair system of education, as opposed to um, the really corporate model that we have right now. Uh, so the three core demands of the National Day of Action are free public college, a cancellation of student debt, and a $15 an hour minimum wage um, for people who work on the campus. And how's that going to be paid? Um, the 1% of people in society that are hoarding um, the wealth. Depending on the state or locality, they're, they're, they're pushing over about 50% in taxes. How much higher do you think? How mm -hmm. much more do you think they should pay? Um, I think enough until we have a system where not one in two American families are uh, threatened with poverty. So where I do they that, go? Um, Let's say if you tax them, they're smart folks, these people, this, this, these 1% hoarders, right? So if they leave here. Yeah then who's going to pay for all this stuff that you want? If they leave? The country. Oh, um, I mean, there's always going to be a 1% a in the U.S. Do you that, think the 1% um, could pay for all of this? Absolutely. They've done studies on this, kid. I don't want to get boring here. But even if you were to take the 1% mm -hmm. and take all of their money, tax it 100%, do you know that couldn't keep Medicare, just Medicare in this country going for three years? Did you know that? I don't. I, yeah, I don't believe that. Do you I know mean, that how are... much it will cost to ma mandate a $15 minimum wage across the country, to have every one student le loan debt paid off, to pay for public college for everyone? How much? Do you have a rough idea on the cost of just the educational part, on the student loan part and the public well, college? Yeah, part? absolutely. One, one point, one point $1.3 trillion in student debt, that's just a beginning. Um, and then billions and billions of dollars. Do you know how much you get fully in... taxing the 1%? 100 percent um i don't know is it close to the number the, the 16 trillion. trillion dollars that we trillion. spent to bail out no, the no, bank hear what i'm saying because i just want this to be a math reminder one trillion yeah. which would barely keep medicare going for three years that's one area 
even if we repositioned it to go into this area that you want, we don't have enough mm -hmm. to do it. So you're going to have to find other means of getting money, right? So Neil Cavuto is really, really intelligent, and he's just really picking on the kid here. I mean, as someone who is so sophisticated uh, linguistically, someone who is uh, so educated, uh, really shouldn't be wasting their time with this. I mean, this girl, first of all, she's clearly moronic. She doesn't have a clue what she's uh, asking for. She's basically asking for the moon and half of the sun. Um, but does showing how much smarter you are than a kid mean that this is wrong? I mean, okay, so I showed that this pumpkin spice latte drinking basic bitch from California doesn't know anything about what she's asking for, and she's not very intelligent. So that proves that socialism is not good. So I think that conservatives should hold themselves to a higher standard. Uh, because, for example, the issue is that we see very little of this. Let me ask you a question. Wait, let me ask you a question first. All right. Is John Kerry, uh, is John Kerry really the best? I mean, I think, you know, John Kerry's not is a terrible he the best? guy. Like, is he, no, no, is I he thought the, Lincoln was good. Is he the best the Democrats can do? Is he the best the Democrats yeah, can do? Yeah, this year. I'd always thought in a, in a democracy, and again, I don't know, I've, I've only lived in this country, um, that there's a process, uh, the, what do they call them, primaries. Right. And uh, they don't always go with the best, but they go with whoever won. So is he the best? according to the process. Your partisan, um, what do you call it, uh, hacks. Wait, John, wait, like, let, me, so, let me tell you something valuable that I think we do. When politicians come on, Yeah. it's nice to get them to try and answer the question. And mm -hmm. in order to do that, we try and ask them pointed questions. I want to contrast our questions with some questions you asked John Kerry. If, if, you want to, if you want to compare your show to a comedy show, you're more than no, no, welcome but here's, to. No, no, here's, here's the point. If, if, Kerry that's, doesn't have, if that's your goal, no, it's not. I wouldn't aim for here's, us. I'd aim for Here's the problem. That's Kerry a very good show. Kerry won't come on this show. He will come on your show. Let me suggest right. why he wants to Well, we have show. civilized discourse. Well, here, here, here's, here's an example of civilized discourse. Here are three of the questions you asked John Kerry. Yeah. You have a chance to interview the Democratic nominee. You asked him mm -hmm. questions such as, quote, how are you holding up? Is it hard not to take the attacks personally? Yeah. Have you ever flip-flopped, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Didn't you feel like you got the chance to interview the guy? Why not ask him a real question instead of just suck up to him? Yeah, how you're holding up is, uh, is a real suck up. And uh, uh, I actually was giving him a hot stone massage. <laughs> I didn't realize that, and maybe this explains quite a bit, no, the opportunity is that the, the news organizations look to Comedy Central for their cues on integrity. <laughs> We're a debate show. It's like saying the no, one no, channel no, no, no. that'd be great. To a storm I would love to see a debate show. 30 minutes in a 24-hour day where we have each side on as best no, we no, can No, 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 no. That would be great. And have to, them fight it out. To do a debate would be great, but that's like saying pro-wrestling is uh, John, a show John, about John, athletic John, competition. I, I think you're a good comedian. I think your lectures are boring. Let me ask you, let yeah. me ask you a question on the news. Now, this uh, is theater. I mean, it's, it's it obvious. Is, no, no, it How old are you? 35. And you wear a bow tie. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> so, I do. so this is... No, no, I know, I know. So you're right. Theater. Theater. Let me just go. Now, come on. And come listen, on. I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that you're, that, not, you're not a smart guy, because those are not easy to tie. But I don't doubt for a minute these people who work for President Bush, who I disagree with and everything, they right. believe that stuff, John. This is Here, not here's a lie or deception at I all. Think they, they believe, believe in him. I think they believe... Just like I believe in my guys. I think they believe President Bush would do a better job, and I believe the Kerry guys believe President Kerry would do a better job. But what I believe is they're not making honest arguments. So what they're doing is, in their mind, the ends justify uh, John, the means. I, 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 I hate to say so, at all. I, I, mean, I do think you're more fun on your show, uh, just my opinion. But can, can okay, you say, Zach, John Stewart goes one-on-one you know one with his though? fans. You're as big a dick on your show as you are on any show. <laughs> <laughs> and now, say what you will about John Stewart. He's a great debater, and he's smart, and he's quick. He has quick wit. And these guys really can't uh, speak to people on their same intellectual level because it makes them seem not that smart. So Tucker Carlson, for example, really makes his career off of having people that are as intelligent as him agree with him and then, you know, destroying, pick, you know, picking apart people that are less intelligent than him. And whenever he is confronted with someone who is, you know, on his same plane, well, he just all of a sudden doesn't seem like such an intelligent person. So really, other than this, uh, we're just we're just kind of letting uh, idiots be the baseline for what we think is wrong and really intelligent people be the baseline for what we think is right. I think that's a really, really uh, messed up way to go about life and I don't think that that's a good way to uh, to prove anything about your ideology. So that is the end of Front and Center. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to The Unshackled for allowing us to use their platform. If you have any ideas or opinions, tweet at me at FRNT and Center. You can also find me on Facebook. I'll read the most interesting comments on the air. 
Uh, remember to please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, and there are always two sides to the story, so keep it central. Thanks for tuning in to Front and Center. Please visit frontandcenter.net.au for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. And keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.